happy Sabbath to you. Thank you. We're just, um, yeah, we're just greeting um, everyone who has joined and um, yeah, slowly getting into it. Um, so we've been very blessed with um, the presentations and all the good information that Dr. Clark had for us um, so far. Um, we're just, um, okay, just muted myself. We are live on YouTube as well. So, um, yeah, so we've been very blessed with um, all the information we have received so far. Um, we just want to quickly remind everyone again about our presentation presentations. So the YouTube um, live links are available for um, watching and sharing later as well. And the edited presentations will be uploaded on Rumble. So you can watch on our channel on Rumble as well. Again, write your questions. Um, if you are on Zoom, write your questions on Zoom in the chat section. If you are watching live on YouTube, then on YouTube. So, um, yeah, um, I think we would all like to know what those lifestyle choices are that we're going to talk about today. And uh, Dr. Clark is going to share with us. I think the exciting news is that um, a lot of these lifestyle choices, a lot of the um, recommendations are very inexpensive and sometimes free. So um, we will let um, Dr. Clark explain to us more when he's ready. All right. Let's see if I can share my screen here. There we go. Well, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, as we share together, as we think about what will bring good health, we pray that you'll guide our minds, give us wisdom, help us to be wise in our lifestyle choices. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've subtitled it, Thriving in Health, Making Sense of Recommendations. A lot of people ask, what can I do just to be healthy? If I could just follow a program, do you have a schedule for me? Can you write me out something that if I follow it, it'll assure me good health? And I think that's a very important uh, question and concept because you know, if I could just do something right, could I benefit, could I reap the results, could it be worthwhile for me? And so this topic uh, today helps put everything into a framework or hopefully it makes more sense and it makes it doable. And at the end of the day, the, the health improves. And sometimes it's taken people maybe all their life to uh, get sick. <laughs> I mean, the body uh, sustains a lot of abuse before it deteriorates. And uh, that said, uh, it might take you more than a couple of days to recover because you've been doing this so long once it has deteriorated. But this gives you the framework of things that uh, if you do them, uh, you'll have life. Uh, I remember we had a lady came to us with back pain and she was suffering and she didn't know why and she wanted to get it fixed and we put her on a program and uh, it was working somewhat, but uh, we weren't getting the type of results we had hoped for. And so I started asking her a lot of questions and then I discovered that her life was totally unscheduled. It was unpredictable perhaps when she'd get up in the morning, when she'd eat breakfast, when she would do different things. And so she was always making her body guess what was gonna be the next thing to happen. And uh, so, well, we put her on a tight schedule and the back pain went away. She was doing all the right things. She just wasn't doing them uh, according to a planned schedule. And it's interesting that 90% of disease could be avoided if people just uh, followed the laws of health that they know. A lot of people, you know, you ask them, are you doing everything you know that you should be doing to, to be healthy? Well, I know I could be doing this better. I know I could be doing that better. And so they have a knowledge of things. 
that they aren't following and and to him to know to do right and does it not you know uh, you, you can't expect good results if you aren't even living up to what you do know i was uh, giving uh, well i went to a, a, a a meeting and and i was supposed to give a talk and i said well what should we talk about today <laughs> i sort of left it open for them and so what are some options and i listed a few and some one one uh, person said well why don't we go over the eight uh, laws of health and i said well that's a good idea and another lady said oh no we know all the eight laws of health do we have to go over that again i mean we should all know that uh, that would just but the others persisted, and so I started in on the eight laws of hell with this talk. And it wasn't long before the lady who was complaining she already knew all the eight laws of health, and that would just be review, was saying, oh, was that part of the eight laws of health? I didn't know that. Oh, I'm not following that. And, and so she realized that there were things that she wasn't doing. And uh, so there's a lot of things people could do. So... I'm a lifestyle physician. I first started seriously studying health at age, well, 14, when I was in ninth grade. And uh, I bought the book, Councils and Diets and Foods, and started reading through it. And then in 2006, I left my conventional practice um, to pursue my interest in lifestyle medicine and to start doing uh, education for folks. And this has led us uh, far and wide. And so an overview of where we're headed today, you know, how can you adopt a simple life style that will promote health and uh, get good results? That's what we want to cover. How, you know, how many here look forward to having a simple workable lifestyle plan for good health? And, uh, and why do we need a good lifestyle plan for good health? Now I asked the question, have you noticed the hand of God today? And we like to look up at the stars and think about uh, the vastness of creation. And it is God who keeps us going. I mean, Acts 17, 25 and 28, he giveth to all life and breath and all things. So every time you breathe, you can thank God. How many times do you breathe a minute? You know, 16 maybe. Uh, so you can be thanking God for every breath of air. Reading on, for in him we live and move and have our being. And so God keeps us alive every second, every moment. He gives us every heartbeat. That's what keeps us alive. And uh, he's intimately involved. I mean, he knows the number of hairs on your head. Uh, he knows when a sparrow falls. And he's uh, more jealous of your uh, well-being than of even the sparrows. And so he's keeping us alive every second. Now, that raises a question, especially if you're sick. You might be thinking, okay, if he's keeping me alive every second, why can't he keep me alive healthy instead of keeping me alive sick? It'd be much nicer if he could keep me alive healthy. And, and why can't perhaps he keep me alive healthy if he's keeping me alive every second? Well, this is the crux of the whole matter. And if we go to... Exodus, we read, if thou will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God. That means listen. And will do that which is right in his sight. And will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. He says, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. So what limits him from keeping you alive healthy is opposed to keeping you alive sick. It's whether or not you are putting yourself in his hands, giving him the loyalty to his laws. He says, I've got these laws. For example, the first law was don't eat from the wrong tree in the garden. <laughs> well, man went and ate from the wrong tree in the garden. And every sickness since then has been the result of, of sin um, that uh, is now reigning in our world. So, and then he says, I am the Lord that healeth thee. Who is your healer? If it's not God, are you really healed? And so we want to look at God's health laws. I mean, a lot of people look at health laws for other reasons. I mean, we cannot be too often reminded that health does not depend on chance. It is a result of obedience to law. 
I mean, this is recognized by the contestants in athletic games and trials of strength. These men make the most careful preparations. They submit to thorough training and strict discipline. Every physical habit is carefully regarded. They know that neglect, excess, or carelessness, which weakens or cripples any organ or function of the body, would ensure defeat. And so they'll do things that otherwise people won't do. And, and, and so we should consider ourselves as, as, you know, looking forward to a goal as they look forward to a goal. And our goal is good health for a number of reasons. And uh, so we want to make sure that we follow the laws that will give us good health. It's like the Ten Commandments. If we follow the Ten Commandments, we know we can be free from guilt. If we follow the laws of health, we can be free from disease. And so we want to be as healthy as possible. So I'm going to put uh, the laws of health into a schedule here. And I'm going to go through the schedule point by point. And I'm going to talk about some of the reasons for having a schedule and for why point by point. And uh, that way you can uh, order your life. And, and this would be a, a schedule that I might put together, at least the parts of it, for any person whose life is out of order and they're physically suffering disease as a result of not being careful to follow God's plan of health. And so here I have Moses at the bottom of the Ten Commandments, and then I have the schedule. <laughs> and so you want to establish a schedule. Um, you know, this is just an example. You can make your own, but I'm just going to pick these times. They are good times. They have a lot of good reasons for good times. Uh, there's a few things that, uh, you know, we could uh, even adjust on this schedule if we wanted to optimize it. But uh, this is definitely a good schedule for a lot of people. And so, first of all, to everything, there is a season, a time, to every purpose under the sun. That comes from Ecclesiastes. And I think we need to take that seriously. I mean, there's always going to be disruptions to your schedule. But if you can be scheduled about things, people who are on a regular schedule have less autoimmune disease. People who are on a regular schedule have less diabetes, cancer, high blood pressure. Uh, they have less insomnia. Uh, they have better sleeping. People are on a regular schedule have better digestion. And so on this regular schedule, we want to start with a good rising time. Now, a good rising time suggests that you got to bed at a good time too, right? <laughs> Can't get very early if you stayed up all night. Um, and so Proverbs says, how long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? Oh, well, he's saying that, not me. Um, but yeah. Uh, it's, it's like a lot of people just like to lay in bed and, 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 and indulge. And, and, but it's good to have a regular rising time. That way your body can wake up and, and it'll wake up better if you do it at the same time every day. You see, I learned a lot uh, when I was in, well, was actually when I was in grade school. Our science uh, uh, textbook had a story or, or, or an experiment done where they studied soybeans. And uh, in this science uh, textbook, it showed a picture of the soybeans and a bright light. And the, what happened, well, the way that what the scientists did is every morning, for, for one morning, at one morning, they came out into their soybean patch and shined a bright light on the soybeans at 3 a.m. Now, the sun isn't usually up at 3 a.m. yet. And so at 3 a.m., they shined this bright light on the soybeans. And when they shined the bright light on the soybeans, the soybeans turned their leaves because they thought it was the sun. And they turned their leaves up to this light to start photosynthesizing. Well, then the scientists came out every morning for a whole week at 3 a.m. to look at their soybeans without the bright light. And every morning for a whole week, the soybeans turned their leaves up at 3 a.m. to find the light that they thought would be there since it was there at one time. Wow, you mean soybeans run on clocks? Yep, and so do you. And if soybeans run on clocks, you know, this is a very important uh, concept that you need to realize that if you can run yourself on a good clock system, if you can be on a good schedule, you can take advantage of this. So rising at the same time every morning, even exercising at the same time every day, you get better endorphins. Uh, 
eating at the same time every day, you get better blood sugar control, better digestion, exercising at the same time every day. Uh, I mean, it's even good to pray at the same time every day. I mean, there's a lot of things doing at the same time every day. Remember Daniel, he prayed three times a day toward Jerusalem. Being scheduled has uh, the advantage of uh, helping you not to forget something. And so how long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou rise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and thy want as an armed man. And uh, so going to bed it will help you get up in the morning. And notice at the bottom of my chart down there, I have something that says to bed at 930. Lights out, no devices, no lights, uh, total, total darkness. And this is hugely important. And if you get to bed by 9.30, then you can get up by 5.30. Uh, even 9 would be better. Uh, what happens is if you go to bed at 11, your melatonin, at least the melatonin that comes from your pineal gland, is all messed up. And you get a surge at a wrong time. It's interesting that uh, autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis uh, often uh, are found to have... Uh, your clock messed up, especially as uh, how your melatonin arises and also your cortisol. There's a mismatch. The clocks are out of sync of these two hormonal uh, surges early in the morning. And so you end up with, well, yeah, rheumatoid arthritis. And the cure then is being regular. And if you go to bed at 930, then you'll have a good surge of melatonin at the wee hours of the morning. And it can be predictable in its time and in its quantity. So melatonin helps a lot of things, especially as an antioxidant. And if you're missing it, then you're more likely to get cancer, for example. So sending you to bed at 930 is very good. And notice I said lights out, no devices, no lights. We're talking, you know, smartphones, computers, TVs, tablets, anything that's putting blue light in your eyes going to mess with your melatonin. You go to bed and get on your device and uh, you're really deprogramming your melatonin. So going to bed at 9.30 makes it so you can get up at 5.30. I mean, if people just follow that, they're going to make good success. But just a regularity and schedule does a lot for your health, um, believe it or not. Now, I'm going to go to the top of the chart there where I've highlighted in red uh, the first item out of four items there. This is sort of your wake-up routine, your your morning uh, uh, schedule of things to do to help your day get started out, right? These things here will do more for you than coffee. Mentioning coffee, coffee messes with your sleep, coffee messes with all kinds of things. And so you don't wanna be using uh, you know, chemicals to try to you know, prop yourself up from all your other bad lifestyle habits. Being regular here, this will help you. And so I say drink some water, warm water with lemon in it in the morning. How much? Well, it sort of depends on your size. You know, 750 milliliters would be great. A liter would probably be good for bigger people. Men should probably do a liter, women 750 milliliters. Uh, what this does is it gets you hydrated from the start. It gets you off to a, you know, you can get on the starting line and start your race. <laughs> not, your, not that every day has to be a race, but since we used the illustration of a race there earlier, and athletes uh, paying more attention to their health than most people. Uh, we'll continue with that uh, theme. And so drinking water helps to hydrate and the lemon helps. And, and what it is, is between the lemon and the water, you start cleansing your bowels. The warm water starts cleansing your bowels. The lemon <coughs> gets your liver to start uh, cleansing. I mean, this is, this is a way of getting things and your liver is for your strength. Is. I, was, I was in Korea for a while teaching and uh, they said, when somebody has a lot of strength, we say they have a big liver. I said, why a big liver? Because that's where your energy comes from. And it's true. You know, your, your liver is involved in energy storage and energy release. And, and if you can get your liver cleansed in the morning, well, then you can avoid taking things like caffeine to try to wake yourself up. You get your liver to, to go in. And then our next thing on our list there is take a cool shower or cool sponge bath. And down below, we have a gentleman there with this uh, brush scrubbing. And what this does for you is it gets your circulation going. It stimulates your nerves. I mean, this is a great substitute for people who want to drink coffee. This is, 
this is a real wake up. And uh, yeah, it doesn't have to be ice cold. I mean, just uh, cool. But uh, scrubbing your skin under cool water makes it so that uh, your nerves and your circulation are ready for the day. It gives, it, it, it's a tonic for them. And uh, so I recommend this uh, for people. And uh, it's, 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 it's hugely helpful. And then uh, taking a walk um, outdoors. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I don't think I read you the other one, did I? The sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg in harvest and have nothing. So if you're worried about the cold, think about that text. Um, so I grew up on a farm and I remember one day it was ice cold out and snowy and, and uh, yet we wanted to be out on our tractors doing some plowing. And I'm like, it's cold. My dad quoted me that text. And so it's definitely apropos. But yes, uh, cold will come and go, and, and activity is what helps warm you up. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. So interesting text because we say walking is the best exercise, and it helps you to live. And so you want to stay in the land of the living? Keep active. If you keep wiggling, they won't put you in a box. Now, an outdoor walk has huge benefits especially if you're doing it just around sunrise. The pink rays of the sun stimulate your, your neurotransmitters. The, uh, the fresh air uh, gets you more vitality because it's got more negative ions. The pollution is usually less in the morning in the air. There's all kinds of benefits to being out there in the morning walking and getting away from stress and seeing the wonders of God's great creation. All kinds of things that'll benefit you taking it doesn't have to be a long walk 10 to 15 minutes we're not saying that this is your time to see if you can walk five miles um i mean if you want to do that you can but it's not a part of this health program and uh, because little walks more frequently through the day interval training if you please as they call it has greater benefits than trying to do one big long walk and then sitting the rest of the day and so walking in the morning and deep breathing when you breathe deep out there and keep your shoulders back and stand up straight and walk, you know, this is very important to, to people who want to be, and, and these are the laws of health. I'm just going through these laws of health. And instead of putting Bible texts, I could have put in, you know, spirit prophecy quotes, but, but we're going through Bible texts on this. And um, if you want to go to my website and you want to look up the handout for this, look up lifestyle choices, uh, rev14.com and go to presentation handouts to look up lifestyle choices with references. There's two downloads. One's just this schedule. The other one is the schedule with all the references. And you can just have that as a resource. And so you can download this schedule and make it yours by writing on it if you like, print it out. All right. The third, the fourth thing is to and engage in gratitude therapy. <laughs> um, I mean, maybe that sounds too technical. Be happy, be healthy, you know, be thankful. And uh, Psalms 105 1 says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, sing unto him, sing psalms unto him. I guess I could have put sing a song in the morning too on your schedule. <laughs> Uh, talk ye of his wondrous works. Glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them that rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face evermore. And so as we engage in gratitude therapy, as we're thankful, as we look to God as the giver of all things, this has wonderful benefits. I mean, we could do a whole talk on gratitude and gratitude therapy, and maybe we should sometime. But uh, people who are thankful live longer. They have less pain. They have better survival from cancer. Uh, they have a better mental outlook. They have less depression. I mean, it's all kinds of benefits to, to, well, returning thanks to God. And returning thanks to God is really part of, of, of completing the great circle of beneficence God gives to us, and we give back to him. And so it's, it's definitely part of being healthy. And people who do this have been shown to improve and health. 
Now I put in here a, an item called personal devotional time. Open your Bible, get thoughts from, from above. Job 23, 12, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Uh, some of us uh, would never miss a meal. Why not never miss a time of meditation with God, opening his word? And uh, Job says, I, you know, I would rather study his word than eat, basically he's saying. And certainly, you know, morning time is a good time to do this. And uh, so, and people who do this, a lot of studies on spirituality and health um, about the, the benefits for people who are, for example, weekly attendees at religious services or, or people who make uh, God first, last, and best in everything. Behold, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prosper. And so God does want us to be healthy spiritually and physically, and the two go together. And so a lot of people won't get healthy or well until they get it right spiritually. Uh, in other words, it's probably the spiritual issues, uh, well, the sin that is at the basis of why they're sick. And uh, I've had people tell me, oh, I'm this sick and I'm that sick and I've got this other problem and, and, uh, and I can't get better. And, and, uh, and then I realized uh, from their talking that there's a lot of stress in their lives. And so we help them with their spiritual stress uh, from... Uh, fear, worry, you know, anger, and, uh, and then their physical symptoms improve. Now I put here this text, uh, uh, Ephesians 2.14. Um, stress is a lack of peace, really. It's a, it's a psychological uh, evaluation. He's under stress. It's emotional stress. It's psychological stress. And we might say, well, what we need instead of stress then is peace. Well, how do we get peace? And there's all kinds of people having all kinds of interesting psychological exercises to try to get peace. But I find it interesting in Ephesians 2, 14, that says, for he is our peace. It doesn't just say you should have peace or, I mean, there's other texts in the Bible that say things like, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. And those are good too, but, 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 but really, Sometimes you can't achieve peace out of your tangled mess, but he is our peace. He has peace. And in being in him, peace is in you. And so it goes beyond perhaps uh, trying to, yeah, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing, nothing shall offend them. Well, okay, how do I love thy law? How do I, you know, what's, and then people come up with, you know, different uh, law studying exercises to try to achieve more peace, but really, you just let him into your life and your heart and your mind and your soul. And he is your peace because he is always at peace. Now, I have people drink herbal teas to counteract or to fix health issues. Uh, you know, the Bible says that uh, he causes the, the grass to grow for the cattle and the herb for the service of man that he may bring forth food out of the earth. And so we talk about the herb as being for the service of man and for the healing of man or for the uh, maintenance of health of man. And so herbal teas are very important. When do you drink them? Because we say you shouldn't drink with your meals because drinking with your meals dilutes your digestive juices and it's harder to digest your food. So when shall I, you know, drink uh, my, uh, my, my tea? Well, I say a half hour before meals, and I have an error there on my chart. You can see before lunch, I put a copy and pasted the, uh, that should say 11 o'clock instead of 6.30 herbal teas. But anyway, half hour before the meals. And so uh, half hour before breakfast. Uh, so if you have, say, you have cancer, then there's herbal teas we recommend for cancer. If you have uh, bleeding, then, you know, shepherd's purse, uh, uh, would be a good herbal tea. I mean, herbal uh, medicine would be a whole, you know, another topic. Then. And we don't recommend tinctures and pills, and we just recommend taking the herb and making a tea out of it. And so you can, or you can eat the fresh herb if that's, uh, but I would eat that with a meal, not before a meal like this, but you can make tea half hour before meals. 
And so picking a verb that fixes the problem is beneficial. Now let's talk about the breakfast. Genesis 129, I put down for a comment on the food given you. And God said, I give you every seed grain plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. Here's what you're supposed to eat right here. Eat this. And uh, let's see, does that include uh, bacon and eggs? No, that's not part of your breakfast. Well, okay, seed bearing plant. In the face. How long did Adam live eating this? I guess he lived uh, about 930 years, didn't he? Or was it 60 years? So uh, he lived over 900 years. And um, well, okay, so let's talk about what to eat for breakfast. You'll notice I've highlighted there eating 80% of your breakfast is fresh fruit. Yes, I've had this work good for diabetics. Yes, I've had this work good for cancer patients. Yes, this works good for everybody. I mean, what do you think Adam ate? Fried potatoes? I mean, no, that's not any cooking and, and eating. And, and I'm not saying 100% to raw food diet's good for you. Uh, a lot of people try to academically see if they can eat everything raw and they start eating things they shouldn't eat raw, raw. And that's not good. So I say 80% fresh fruit. And if you tell people that, they'll probably uh, achieve 50 to 60%. <laughs> but I say 80% would be good. And uh, uh, I know we went on a, well, well, we try to eat a lot of fresh fruit and vegetables. And for a while, we, we did go nearly 100%. And we found we had more energy doing that. Um, but we like some cooked things. And there is a reason for eating good cooked things. And we'll get to it here as we get to that point on this, on this list. But if you can start today with lots of fresh fruit, you've got nutrient-dense foods. I mean, the more you process things, the more the nutrients go out of it. You grind uh, things. You do all kinds of, you know, you buy packaged pre-prepared foods and its nutrition value is much lower than fresh fruits and vegetables. At this point, somebody's probably saying, yeah, but the fruits are have been in the cold storage for a long time at the supermarket and they've been, they're still better than stuff that's been processed. What do you think the processed stuff is? I mean, what are your alternatives? I mean, it'd be good to have your own garden. It's good to go to farmer's markets. Those are probably, those are superior choices, but I'm still saying, you know, you used to go into the, to the shop to get uh, meat products or processed products, uh, start getting the stuff that's, uh, you know, still packaged the way God packaged it with all its nutrients, or at least all its uh, components. And uh, this is very, very helpful. Then I say nuts and seeds. You see, nuts and seeds. So fruit would have all your, uh, 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 all your water-soluble vitamins. And uh, nuts and seeds then have your uh, fat-soluble vitamins. And nuts and seeds are also high in minerals, which are very good for you. And, uh, and nuts and seeds go well. Uh, so fruit, oh, you can mix fruit with beans, which is really a seed. Nuts and seeds, uh, grains, which is really a seed. and um, and, and, and do well, but you can't mix fruits with vegetables. So what's a fruit? Well, a fruit has a, has a, a seed in it usually. Uh, and a fruit uh, is usually the product of a flower, usually. And, and the fruit is, uh, yeah, the fruit of the plant and product of the plant. I mean, uh, technically, uh, you know, it has to do with the uh, polycarp uh, uh, ovum and so forth, but uh, we won't get into technical things. It's, it's really what the, what the contain the seeds. So things that have seeds are like, you know, pumpkins, so squash, uh, um, uh, your capsicum or your peppers, uh, your cucumbers. Uh, uh, these are all fruits, uh, avocados, uh, um, bananas, uh, you know, apricots, uh, things that have seeds. And so does a watermelon have a seed? Well, it's a fruit. Um, and, and does a tomato have a seed? Well, it's a fruit. Then don't mix it with a vegetable. And if you mix uh, fruits and vegetables, it tends to cause problems for your brain. And, and uh, it's a little bit like, I guess, uh, yeah. Well, anyway, so, uh, and then I say 20% cooked. And it's good to have something warm. If all your food's always cold, your body has to warm it up. That takes energy. I mean, you know how it is when you, the weather's cold outside, it takes energy to keep yourself warm. And if you have, uh, have, uh, cooked food that's warm, your body doesn't have to warm it up. It can start digesting it. You know how it is. Uh, uh, 
up there in northern Queensland, you have uh, crocodiles. Well, sometimes a crocodile lays out in the sun to warm up so it can digest his food. <laughs> um, same with snakes and lizards and so forth uh, that are cold blooded. They get out there and warm up so they can digest their food because they can't digest, cannot digest their food when they're cold. Well, you, you can warm up your food, but it'll take longer. So if you eat something warm, it'll help. And, and things that are often good for warm for breakfast, you know, like uh, oatmeal or, or um, you know, waffles or, or, or toast or, or uh, make, put warm milk on cereal. Um, the different things that are warm people can eat. Uh, you can make uh, things out of fruit, uh, you know, fruit crisp. Uh, um, you don't have to put all the sugar in it. You can make it a breakfast meal instead of a, a dessert. There's all kinds of things you can make. And we have recipes on our website for some interesting things. And so a little cooked stuff can be beneficial. Now here I have something that says supplements in a very bright colored picture. I'm not real big on supplements. More and more we're learning that uh, there's better natural alternatives. People who take supplements and depend on uh, laboratory preparations um, can be tricked. I know, so, so you sent me a little video of somebody that showed that the printing on, on tablets was actually a, I guess we'd say a poison, a magnetic poison, graphene oxide. Um, so you're better off eating food, you know what's in it, that's for sure. Most of the pills are poisonous. Vitamin A, vitamin E are toxic and cause uh, uh, cancer if you take them as a pill as opposed to eating them in good food. Folic acid is a poison, uh, causes cancer. And the better to eat uh, something else called folate in uh, spinach and so forth. Anyway, supplements, but sometimes people uh, consider themselves low in certain things and we we recommend uh, them taking something. For example, if you uh, aren't getting enough sunshine and not getting your vitamin D that way as you should be, then the only way to catch up perhaps is a vitamin D tablet. Um, vitamin B12, if uh, you know, you're polishing and waxing and cleaning your food too much and you're not getting your vitamin B12 or you have other lifestyle issues that are causing you not to get your B12 due to eating too much sugar, having too much inflammation in your body or getting too many fermented foods, then uh, you might uh, end up to catch up taking a tablet uh, of vitamin B12 once in a while. Um, some people are behind on their minerals, selenium, magnesium, uh, iodine, whatever. But the best way is to get it from food. If you're not getting it from your food or from a herb, like our herbal teas we talked about, um, then to catch up, you might take a supplement, but uh, beware that uh, I've had people get on these supplements and get heavy metal poisoning. I've had people get on these supplements and have other things go wrong and uh, digestive issues. And uh, they're, they're certainly can be problematic. So we're very careful about not taking supplement. God didn't say, you know, you should eat supplements to add them. And everybody says your food's getting deficient and that's because you're eating processed food um, and you're not gardening yourself. But um, that's a whole discussion all on its own. So we'll come back to that some other time. After every meal, it's good to take a walk. We call it a therapeutic walk. Um, the therapeutic walk is there to help you to have better digestion, to have better circulation, to have um, you know, uh, a better blood sugar control. Um, Psalms 48, 12, walk about Zion and go around about her. Tell the towers thereof. So look around as you walk, climb mountains, climb towers. <laughs> it's all good. And, and notice I, I should go back. I highlighted clothing. Our little man there who's uh, walking up his mountain with his legs bare and his arms bare is not going to be as healthy as somebody wearing long sleeves and long pants. Um, you know, in your car, you have a radiator out front and it gets rid of heat. People think their legs are radiators and their arms are radiators, but your body doesn't work like that. Uh, your body's much better off having clothing down to your wrists and down to your ankles and having uh, good uh, coverage because then you'll have better circulation 
and the better circulation will make it so that uh, you you don't have uh, uh, inflamed blood coming back to your chest, abdomen, and pelvis. If the blood's inflamed and comes back into your lungs, you know, you're more likely to get uh, asthma. If your blood's inflamed and, and congests your head, you're more likely to have nosebleeds. I mean, if your ankles are cold for men, it changes the blood flow in the prostate. You're more likely to have prostate problems. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the animals tend to have fur that covers them all over. Um, we have to make decisions on it. We're left with the choices as to whether or not we cover our extremities. I mean, you go to Arab countries where the temperatures go up, uh, you know, 40, 50, 40, I don't know about 50, but 40 degrees. And uh, they're wearing long sleeves and long gowns and covering themselves. And why is that? Well, actually it's more healthy and cooler. It doesn't have to be a winter jacket for sure, but uh, being evenly clothed and uh, protected is very helpful. And it's very important for, for, for avoiding diseases. Now I say mid-morning, two hours after breakfast, that you drink uh, some more water. And I usually say, drink the same amount of water you drank in the morning. So if you're a man, you're drinking a liter. If you're a woman, you're drinking 750 milliliters. But uh, drinking water, and, and at that point, uh, you can add things if you want, such as a charcoal powder, if you're fighting some disease as a detox. Um, here I put Revelation 22, 17, and the spirit of, and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come, and let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. So take the water of life freely. I know that has spiritual applications as well, but we can take it uh, literally here as well. And so drinking plenty of good water, keeping well hydrated. 90% uh, of Australians are dehydrated meaning they're more likely to get the diseases of dehydration, constipation and diverticulitis, uh, colon cancer. For those who are always dehydrated, more likely to get Parkinson's disease, which is neurodegenerative disease. I mean, dehydration increases your likelihood of having high blood pressure and poor cholesterol control and poor blood sugar control. And so good hydration is especially helpful and and on a good daily program, scheduling your water intake, make sure that you will get it. Um, now, I say walk outdoors. If you aren't uh, tied down to a job or something and you have the opportunity, walking periodically through the day, especially if you're fighting some illness, is very, very helpful. It massages all your organs. It gets you moving. So take that as a, a good thing. Keep, keep active. Now here I say lunchtime and uh, I say 80% uh, fresh vegetables or savory fruit. So go into your meals and decide whether you're gonna eat fruits or vegetables. So say you want savory fruit. So that would be like avocado, capsicum, cucumber, tomato, uh, olives, things like that. And you can make a salad out of that or a dish out of that. Or otherwise, your vegetables, which are your uh, roots like a carrot, your stems like a celery, your leaves like a spinach, or your flowers like cauliflower, and um, make a meal out of that. And a lot of fresh stuff is especially good here too. And uh, so uh, also, I put 20% cooked again, and for the same reasons. Now, then take your digestive walk afterwards, Psalms 89, verse 15. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. So getting out and walking is very, very beneficial for digestion, for health, for fresh air, for sunlight. Now again, mid-afternoon, two hours after you finished your meal, taking another... Uh, Dose of water. <laughs> Here we got Isaiah 55 1. Ho, everyone that thirsts, uh, to come to the waters. Not come to the coffee, come to the sodas. No, come to the waters. Um, Genesis 5 24. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And so good to take a walk as well. Um, walk with the Lord. Get out to, if you're not doing anything else, fighting sedentary activities. 
Now here I say an evening meal, it'd be best to skip it. If you are gonna eat an evening meal, eating things are very light, watermelon, melons, papaya, grapefruit, you know, citrus, some kind of fruit, that would be good. And if you do eat the evening meal, take another walk, but you're much better off not eating an evening meal. The sleep of the labor man is sweet, whether you eat little or much, but most people aren't laboring, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. Because, yeah, he isn't laboring, and he eats too much in the evening, and he can't sleep. So you're going to sleep better if you don't eat in the evening. You're going to have better blood sugar controls. You're going to have better, you're going to have lower blood pressures. You're going to have less cancer. Um, and we cover these in the other talks, but uh, just be aware that the evening meal is not your friend. I know it's social. I know everybody thinks they have to do it. I know it becomes habit, just like going to bed too late, getting up too late becomes a habit. You sort of have to fight the, the uh, current sweeping you downstream because otherwise the, the default, what you do without planning doesn't tend to be healthy. And uh, you're gonna eat, take a walk. Okay, so now we say go to bed, lights out. This is very good. He giveth his beloved sleep. He does. And if you can't sleep, maybe he wants you to stay up and pray but maybe you're doing something in your lifestyle that isn't helping you sleep. Or if you're having trouble sleeping. Well, if you're doing all these other things, you usually you sleep better. People who have a schedule sleep better. People who get their exercise during the day sleep better. Uh, and uh, if you're picking herbal teas to help you, there's things like chamomile tea or valerian, different to herbs that can be beneficial. And so getting to bed, 9.30, lights out, no devices, no lights. No lights coming in your windows, and you sleep better. Now, I'm going to just quote here Ecclesiastes Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. You have to think about this as a whole plan for the day and a philosophy. You're eating for strength, you're living for strength, you're, you're doing this for reasons of health not just to, to gratify, not just for entertainment, not just for recreational drug use. Uh, to everything, there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heavens. So in summary, good health is made up of good habits, good choices. Good habits are made up of good consistent choices. Schedule helps make choices consistent. Schedule some good health today. And uh, that will help you with being healthy. All right. I'm going to uh, go ahead and uh, turn off this and stop screen share and go back to the regular. There we go. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, Dr. Clark. Um, yeah, really good information. Yeah, as always, really good, really simple. And sometimes they seem too simple to, to be true, too good to be true, <laughs> and too easy to work, but they do work. I've, um, I've tried myself just by drinking a lot more water. Um, you know, my health um, recovers and um, yeah, it improves a lot more. So yeah, it's amazing what these simple remedies can do. Um, so how much time do we have for questions, Dr. Clark? Again, half an hour or less? Yeah, around half an hour. Okay. Awesome. So we've got some questions. Um, uh, so the first question we received on Zoom is how to gain weight for the underweight. Yes, uh, some people find it hard to maintain their weight. Uh, some people are perhaps genetically um, programmed to be thin. Uh, and society uh, has this cookie cutter. And they want everybody to look the same and to be the same. And it's interesting that uh, 
back in uh, perhaps uh, the 50s, being thin was idealized. And anybody that was overweight uh, was uh, persecuted. Today, everybody's overweight. And so the thin ones are persecuted. So the thin ones are saying, how can we gain weight? <laughs> and it's fascinating that uh, everybody wants to be the cookie cutter same, yet we have individuality. And I want to stress that because people will decide they're too thin and they start doing unhealthy things to try to gain weight. I will talk about how to gain weight here before we get through with this discussion, but uh, there are differences. I mean, I I know they have baby charts that say how big a baby should be by two months. And you go to the doctor and he compares you to the baby chart. And yet he doesn't compare the parents to the baby chart. I mean, here you have, perhaps you have a Filipino couple that are four foot to 11 inches and their baby isn't big enough by two months. So if we compare the chart, well, where'd the chart come from anyway? Well, you know, and then, and then perhaps if you're in Africa where people are seven feet and giants and look, the baby at two months is too big. <laughs> and, uh, uh, sometimes you need to focus on are you healthy, not how much you weigh. And uh, certainly people who eat uh, better will not uh, be as heavy as those who are porking out on, uh, you know, heavy meats and so forth. Um, but that said, some people are worried about their weight. And so they want to do something to try to gain weight. But uh they don't want to do anything unhealthy because maybe they weighed enough when they ate at McDonald's every day, but now they don't eat at McDonald's every day and they don't weigh as much as they used to. And everybody says, you look thin. And uh, so we had a friend who decided after listening to some of our lectures that he was going to go with a hundred percent raw food diet, basically. And he lost more weight than he considered good. What do I do? Well, he, he decided, well, you know, the people trying to, lose weight, avoid carbs. So I'm going to start eating carbs, but I want to stick with my diet plan. So he started eating lots of bananas. I mean, lots of bananas. And uh, he started adding more baked potatoes to, to his menu. And in uh, three months, he gained uh, back about uh, 14 kilos. And he was much uh, happier with his weight. And so he, yeah, he started eat, so eating carbs. Uh, was was key there and uh, i mean you don't want to overeat actually people who overeat uh, sometimes if you thin and you overeat it actually doesn't help one of the big things that helps though is chewing your food better you get more out of your food if you chew it better and so some people are thin because they are stressed out they eat too fast and they don't get the nutrition and the body is stressed out and it doesn't digest it well and so they end up with more more uh, weight issues can go either way. Um, and so chewing your food much better is, is, is also key. Uh, some people have found eating nuts helps gain weight. Other people haven't found that to be the case. Some people have found uh, that uh, uh, eating uh, um, more things in the fruit, like avocados that are high in fat, um, can make a difference. Other people have said that does absolutely nothing. Um, so some of it is experimenting to see what your body seems to simulate best. But, but again, don't let uh, the idea that uh, you aren't the right weight uh, push you to break health laws that would cause you disease in some other areas. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the person says that um, she's five feet seven inch and weight uh, weight about 47 kilos right um, now you can look up a body mass index chart mm -hmm. and um, let me just see here i'll look at my uh thing here see if i can find the body mass index chart and tell you what that would be like all right so if you weighed uh, 40 seven kilos let's see now how to find my australian <laughs> body mass index chart which is here mm -hmm. somewhere um 
All right. Okay, so that would be like uh, a body mass index. Let's see, five, seven. And yes, so you would be on the low side, 103. Um, so yes, uh, eating more carbs is uh, probably the idea that I would start with, like bananas, like baked potatoes, and, uh, and see if that doesn't make a difference. But otherwise, uh, if you're healthy, um, some people, I had, a, I had a friend when I was in academy. I say he was my friend. He was a teacher. I was a I wasn't. So he was, he was like uh, 20 years older than me. He weighed the same as I did. He's the same height as I was. I've always been thin. And he wanted to gain weight. Boy, he wanted to gain weight. And uh, he decided in order to gain weight, he would start uh, going to the gym. And he, weighed, he was like six foot one and weighed 145 pounds. He wanted to weigh 160 pounds. And so he went to the gym, started working out. Eventually, yes, he got his weight up to 160 pounds. You think he looked different? No, he just had more muscles. <laughs> and the muscles were heavy. Of course, muscles are heavier, heavier than fat. He gained his weight, but uh, it really did nothing for the way he looked. Uh, that, but but, but, but uh, anyway, some people are genetically thin. And um, anything they do uh, to try to change that might not be in the best interest of their health. I've heard from yourself as well, Dr. Clark, that um, if you want to like be healthy, because sometimes like thin people, it doesn't mean if you are thin, then you are healthier than the one that maybe has more fat on them. Is that like, that's, yeah, if that's the case, then I've heard from yourself as well that like, if you want to um, restore health, you should first go on a fast and then it's kind of like the body reboots. Is that right? And then um, that might help as well. Yes, that is definitely true. A fast can be helpful. And sometimes if you fast, I mean, if this is still in regards to gaining weight, putting your body into a stress of a food shortage can make it decide to store more. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but uh, certainly, uh, as far as autoimmune diseases go, when you fast for three days, you reset your immune system, your stem cells start pumping out more white cells, you end up with, with a better uh, immune system for fighting disease. So it is worthwhile. Yeah. So the other thing I just wanted to quickly mention is like, um, when we went on a purely uh, plant-based diet, especially raw, we went like predominantly on raw diet. And um, I know that my husband, Dan, he lost a lot of weight in the beginning. And then I believe on the same diet, he gained the same weight back. So I've heard that before as well, that um, if you lose weight on a plant-based diet, then you can gain weight as well on the same diet, but it's like you lose the fat and the, the, toxin, the toxins and everything with it, and then you can gain weight um, on the same diet. Is that like, um, is there science to it or? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a reasonable uh thought there and uh, certainly when you lose weight and the fat goes the toxins come out of the fat and that's uh, sometimes uh, troubling to folks but uh, there's definitely reason to believe that if you're on the right diet and you're doing the right things then you'll have the right weight yeah okay so um oh, Dan is asking so what is a fast especially for three days is eat no food, no water. How do you fast properly and effectively and safely? For this type of fast, uh, where you're trying to reset the immune system, it would be a water only fast. And uh, you definitely want to stay well hydrated. The only time we would do a fast from both water and food is if somebody has an issue with cysts that we're trying to obliterate or get rid of. And so we dehydrate the person to make the cyst dehydrate. Most of the time, it's better not to try that kind of fast. It's uh, rather rigorous and uh, you'd want to keep track of, of all your uh, health parameters to make sure you didn't overdo it. So a water only fast and uh, that resets the immune system. Awesome. 
that makes sense. Um, so the second part of the first question was, I understand from the talk that we can eat all sorts of fruits for cancer. Does that include people with candida? Um, candida is an interesting uh, topic. Um, there's a lot of uh, misinformation out on the web about uh, whether or not you have candida and what to do to fix it. And people adopt lifestyles that to hardly sustain life in order to try to get rid of candida. And then they wonder why they can't get rid of their candida because their, their health has gone downhill so they can't even fight it. Um, our approach to candida is to boost the immune system and fruits are part of that. And uh, so a lot of times the reason the immune system is down is due to some other lifestyle bad habit. Uh, whereas eating fruit is not a lifestyle bad habit. And, and so people then adopt funny, funny lifestyles and habits to try to get rid of candida. Now, not everybody that thinks they have candida has candida. Candida is sort of perhaps a catch-all for anybody who's sick and read the web and decided they had it. Um, and so just to, just to warn you that uh, Candida can become, you know, say this carefully, an excuse for invalidism, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, lifelong disability due to the way you think about your health rather than true health issues. So candida is a, uh, a mold or a yeast, a filamentous fungi. And uh, certainly in a compromised host, uh, somebody's immunosuppressed, it uh, comes up and causes trouble. But uh, on the other hand, uh, if you boost your immune system and follow good health habits, what do we do for candida? Uh, we definitely follow everything we talk about in our pandemic uh, immune boost boosting lecture, but we also use herbal teas for it. And the herbal teas that we use, we source from a, a gentleman that we've worked with in the past. Uh, his website is healingherbs.biz. And he has a tea there called uh, anti-parasite uh, candida tea. And it's got herbs that fight candida, both from the point of view that they're high in iodine, but also high in uh, um, fungi fighting phytochemicals. And so we use herbal teas and we boost the immune system by following good health practices. Very good. So in that case, a person doesn't have to stay away from sugars if they are in natural form. Is that, is that right? You definitely want to avoid processed foods, canned fruit, dried fruit, fruit juices, but eating fresh fruit is not something you need to avoid. Now, if you're borderline diabetic or you're diabetic, uh, you may need to follow our diabetic information, but as you're following before you're, you know, good at following the information of overcome your diabetes, you might uh, be uh, careful not to eat fruits that do send your blood sugars high. So in other words, the glycemic index of the fruit. So tomato is not going to send your blood sugar as high as, say, a pear or, or something like that. So you sort of uh, choose fruits, perhaps, that are less uh, of a high glycemic index uh, initially. But uh, as your blood, if your blood sugars are well controlled, then eating the fruit is not going to cause you to have problems. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, so the next question is for someone who is having four wisdom teeth taken out under general anesthesia, what is good to use for pain post-operation? Surgeon prescribed um, diclofenac, sodium, 25 milligrams to be taken three times a day, the day before surgery to decrease swelling. What is a good alternative? Well, there's a number of things that can be helpful. Uh, clove oil fights pain. Uh, eating celery can fight pain. Uh, there's the farmer's pegs that you can chew on that help fight pain. Uh, but there's also hot and cold treatments or just mostly cold, using cold to, uh, to help fight pain. Uh, these can be beneficial, both hot and cold treatments and, and cold to the area. Um, 
certainly charcoal poultices over the area. Now, uh, you don't, uh, yeah, charcoal poultices are very good at helping pain. What we do is we take and put charcoal, um, mix it with the uh, psyllium husk to make it into a, a poultice. And uh, then we put it into an emptied out tea bag. And uh, when we put it in the tea bag, then it's contained and uh, put that tea bag with its charcoal poultice material over against. Uh, so you'd have to have, I guess, uh, one on each side or two on each side uh, to cover your, your wisdom teeth, the, the, dry, the sockets that are left. And uh, this can de definitely help with pain. It uh, pulls out the inflammation, pulls out the pain mediators. Those are, those are very beneficial. And, and then eating foods that are, are good, uh, turmeric and pineapple, uh, which uh, help fight pain. So foods are gonna be good. And uh, that would be a good, good choice. Yeah, okay. I've definitely tried clove for sore throat and um, yeah, it does help. It does actually numb the area, it's amazing. Um, so uh, there's a question has dr clark done a lecture on brain health such as um dem dementia or alzheimer's so i think we did have a talk on that we, which one was that let's I'll see find. which one did we do let me just pull up my record here and uh Let's see. No, I don't think we have done the one on Alzheimer's yet, but we could at some point. And the Alzheimer's one is called Keeping Your Brain Sharp. And, uh, and of course, if you look, you'll see, if you want to look up uh, on my website, uh, we have the handout for that lecture. And also, if you go to the online videos, uh, we have previous uh, uh, recordings of that lecture. And uh, so, yes, we do a whole talk on keeping your mind sharp on Alzheimer's. Okay. Um, so we have listed, um, we have put down Dr. Clark's um, website. So check that out for, I guess, recipes as dr clark mentioned and um the handouts and this particular presentation as well so um okay so um yeah so another question why is dried fruits um bad as it is still whole food yes there's uh dried fruit uh, you have to uh, take into consideration its impact on your disease. If you're totally healthy, it's fine. But if you have diabetes, it'll give you too much sugar uh, in, in, in comparison to everything else you're eating. Uh, for somebody with candida, uh, it will give you probably too much sugar uh, compared to what else you could be eating. And so for people with certain illnesses where sugar is an issue, then we limit to, from dried fruit but otherwise if you're perfectly healthy and you're not fighting something and you're getting plenty of other good uh, foods then having a little dried fruit uh, can be like a you know a good uh, dessert or uh, something that uh, you enjoy and i eat dried fruit uh, um, and uh, as well as fresh fruit and so forth so and dried fruit can be rehydrated and used when you can't get fresh fruit so that, that's, that's also an option. Yeah, that's true. Very good. So um, we've, got, we've got another question. Dr. Clark, what about protein supplements for muscle building at the gym? Not the dairy ones, but plant-based. For example, organic hemp, pea, or rice protein. Um. You know, some of your strongest, biggest animals like gorillas don't uh, take uh, protein supplements to achieve their muscle mass. And uh, I mean, a lot of people would like to be a silverback, right? <laughs> uh, which is the chief uh, biggest gorilla of the gang. Um, 
sometimes muscle building uh, with its, uh, you know, egotism and its goals aren't uh, in line with, uh, with necessarily good uh, uh, mental, physical, spiritual, and psychological health. But that said, uh, people who are trying to, to gain, uh, you know, fitness uh, might find it that they want, they want some kind of, uh, what we say, a boost to, to achieving it uh, without uh, perhaps having to do all the work. I'll just give you an example, just out of, uh, out of interest. Uh, we had a gentleman who, uh, his job, he was helping his uncle load semi-trailers with firewood by hand. And, and, and so he would be throwing wood around all day, big chunks of wood. And uh, he decided, I'm going to work for my uncle doing this because this will be a workout all the time and I'm going to gain muscles and I'm going to be buff and, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to be the man. Well, he found out that he was, he was on a meat diet and he was, you know, American diet and he was not improving in his strength. He was worn out every evening, still sore months into the project. And, uh, he was like, this just isn't working. This is, well, then he came to some of our lectures and decided he's going to go on a vegetarian diet. And when he went on to a vegetarian diet, within a few weeks, he found out he wasn't coming home tired. His muscle aches went away. He gained his strength. He was able to endure a day's loading of these semis, and it greatly improved his health. And, and so, he, you know, this is where we started out as a church. This is where uh, Joseph Bates uh, he discovered when he was a, a ship captain, he went over, I believe it was somewhere in the UK. He docked up there and uh, he had two crews helping unload. And there was a crew of a couple of Irishmen and there was a crew of a, a group, I don't know, of Englishmen and uh, like about five Englishmen and two Irishmen. And the Irishmen outworked the Englishmen by a long shot. And he thought, well, why is this? How can this be? So he started asking him questions and the Irishmen were vegetarians. And he thought, wow, if the vegetarians can outwork the meat eaters that much, there must be something to it. And really it was Joseph Bates that started our church on a road to vegetarianism. Um, and he became vegetarian and uh, very fascinating. So uh, I, I suppose the vegetarian may not look, uh, uh, quite so uh, bulky as somebody eating the meat, but uh, their endurance and their strength might be quite a bit more. Uh, we've known people who've been champion like uh, 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 dead weight lifters who were avenous, who were total vegetarian, and yet they could compete in their class and win, win the, uh, the strength contest. There was, there was a group, uh, there was a, a bunch of uh, of uh, baseball teams in in Japan, and uh, the coach decided to make his baseball team vegetarian, and they started winning in their in their leagues. And uh, vegetarianism has has got on caught on quite a bit in for athletes. Uh, and so I wouldn't necessarily say that they have to come up with a a supplement. Now let's just go into those supplements you mentioned. When you make a protein isolate out of, for example, pea protein, you end up with a large uh, bunch of free amino acids. And a lot of these different beans are about 20% glutamate. And so you ended up with about 20% free glutamate. Glutamate is a neurotransmitter. It's also known as monosodium glutamate. It causes problems for increased risk of certain cancers, throat cancer, for example, brain cancer, for example. And so just finding something that's high in protein and processing it can actually make it uh, uh, more toxic. Uh, hemp uh, seed is definitely something that's going to give you too much THC, THC being the active component of marijuana. For those who uh, realize that uh, THC causes uh, neuro degeneration, it causes uh, frontal lobe uh, blood flow uh, decreasing, it causes uh, problems with people's ambition. Um, THC is too high. There's no hemp products out there that are not too high in THC. 
studies have shown this. In fact, uh, studies looking at government standards, Canada did this. They looked at all the hemp uh, supplements or even seeds or, or products, and most of uh, all of them were as much as twice too high in THC as what the national standards said a product should or shouldn't have. And so I wouldn't do the hemp thing for sure. And um, so most of the time you're better off eating good food. What has good protein? Uh, people think they can't get their protein. Well, let's just think about protein for a minute. How much protein is in a, a food? Well, the nutritionist will take 100 calories of the food and then that'll be for you know an easy number. You think of 100 as a percent, 100 percent. And then they'll say what percent of the food or what, how many calories out of 100 are from different uh, uh, macronutrients. And in this case, protein. So if you take a beef steak, which seems to be people's uh, favorite uh, source of protein, at least in many cultures, uh, what percent of it is protein? Well, 17%. In other words, I have 100 calories of beef, 17 calories will be protein. Well, if we use that as a standard, think of that, that as something that uh, is valuable as, as, as a number. Uh, what about uh, tomatoes? You think, okay, tomatoes, there's no comparison, right? Well, out of 100 calories of tomatoes, it is 17 calories of protein. It's hard to avoid protein. How about broccoli? Out of 100 calories of broccoli, it's 22 calories coming from protein. So broccoli has more protein than beefsteak, in other words. And so just eating good food. I mean, how did a big uh, bull that's got lots of muscles get all his muscles? Well, by eating grass. And, 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 and so vegetarians can get their strength, not from trying to find something that is particularly just associated with the way the food will be, will be metabolized in your body, but to eat good food so your body can build what it needs to build in the way of muscles. So uh, I would say look to gain strength and do it by eating good food, food that Adam would have eaten and, uh, and be happy with the results. It's more dangerous, isn't it, to, um, to think about what you need to do with the excess protein and all the toxins and that it produces in your system if you have excess protein because when you think about how much protein an adult male needs um what is it dr clark 20 30 something grams of protein a day or well you know if you look at it scientifically an adult male uh, we do hold a, when we do our osteoporosis lecture we go into detail on protein and how much you need but uh, to keep your nitrogen balance in balance and to make sure you have no deficiencies, an adult male probably needs about 12.5 grams of protein a day. Mm -hmm. A day. Less than um, less, yeah, less than the government uh, yeah, food standards, the uh, whatever you call it, recommended daily allowance. Yeah, that's what I think I've learned. 20 something grams of protein a day and i thought that's pretty good like like you said you can't avoid it so yeah um so another question is about hemp again um the question is can hemp products like hemp seeds cause a seizure um i don't think they cause seizure saying that because uh, on the alternative health market, uh, CBD and, 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 and other uh, products, uh, you know, related are used to treat uh, uh, seizures. Mm -hmm. Why are they used to treat seizures? Well, the same reason anything else of a pharmacological nature is used to treat seizures. Basically, it suppresses all brain activity below the threshold of uh, seizure. <laughs> of of going crazy and uh so if you want your brain depressed so it's not functioning a non-functioning brain does not go into seizure how do you treat seizures well there's a number of things for treating seizures uh naturally number one is to figure out the inciting event the stimulus the thing that's pushing the button 
and we've had people with seizures. Uh, they're now not having seizures because they're able to do that. And uh, for example, uh, you know, this thing about uh, eating pea protein and getting lots of MSG, uh, this individual we're working with, uh, if he ate anything that had MSG, he got a seizure. So this would be like nutritional yeast. Nutritional yeast gave him seizures. Uh, Bragg's liquid aminos, uh, soy sauce, you know, all these things that have MSG that don't to claim to have MSG, but it's in there because the way they're processed would cause seizures. So number one is avoiding the things that will stimulate a seizure. Uh, we have another gentleman who got seizures because of electromagnetic fields. If he's around a cell phone, a cordless phone, a Wi-Fi, a cell phone tower, a welding machine, uh, anything with high EMF, he'd get seizures. But if he stayed away from those, he get. So number one is avoiding the thing that's causing the seizures. Usually it's dietary or it can be environmental. And then getting so that you can figure out when you're going to have a seizure. In other words, picking up on the prodrome or the aura before it happens. And then having something in mind or a way of, uh, of uh, derailing the seizure before it happens. A lot of times it can be spiritual where you need to have a Bible text and a promise to claim as you feel like you're going into the seizure. But to use some drug that just basically suppresses the brain below normal functioning, just so you won't have a seizure, you'll lose all the other function as well. You don't, you aren't able to function in any capacity. And so you become a vegetable, whereas these people could be, some of these people could be normal if they just followed good lifestyle habits and uh, natural remedies for their seizure. Mm -hmm. Very good, thank you. So um, obviously I know we're running out of time and I had a few more questions written down, but um, can I just quickly ask Dr. Clark, with the tinctures you mentioned, um, you don't recommend tinctures, is that because of the presence of alcohol or even when they are made with glycerin that still um, the way it's made, you wouldn't recommend that? Um. I'm not real big on tinctures. I have friends that have whole businesses that make tinctures. Uh, certainly you wanna avoid the alcohol tinctures. There's no question about that. You'd never want to introduce the alcohol in your body for a number of reasons. Uh, not just the fact that it could make you drunk or you know, lead to becoming an alcoholic, but uh, also due to the fact of the toxins in alcohol and the viruses associated with fermentation. So if you are gonna use a tincture, you certainly want one that is yeah, glycerin based. Um, and uh, for some people that might be their choice of the way to get uh, their herbal uh, product. Um, there are downsides to trying to preserve things and maintain them in, in, in solution. Um, and uh, which go into the chemistry of what happens with racemization and enantiomers and chiral um, molecules and so forth. Um, in my estimation, you're best off taking as fresh an herb as you can have or even dried and uh, making it into your tea for getting your herbal uh, remedy. Uh, with the tinctures, uh, you can end up with, uh, with more degeneration over time as it's in solution. So uh, people might say it has a shelf life of a year, but it might not have a shelf life of a year before it has, starts having things develop in it that aren't that helpful for you. Mm -hmm. So I'm not real big on tinctures, but for people who you know have a fast lifestyle and would rather pay for something than to put the work into it, I'm not gonna say that uh, you know I forbid them from doing that, but... Uh, I'm much more likely to say it's better to find the herbs and make your tea from scratch. So I send most people to, to places like uh, healingherbs.biz where he sells you a packet with all the dried herb in it, or he even gives you the recipe for it if you wanna make, you know, source them yourself where you live and, uh, and make your own herbal uh, mixture and then keep them. And then, then that's the way the Spirit of Prophecy talks about the herbs kept and then steeped when there's illness 
doing more for you than the medic than the medications mm -hmm. that the doctor can use. Yeah, yeah, that's very good. Because I freeze um, when we were sick. When we were sick, I have a naturopath friend, and she sent me some olive leaves because I was talking to her about the olive leaf extract. And then I actually froze the dry leaves. And then when I want to make tea or steep them, like you said, I just take out the leaves and crush them a little bit and um, just cook them a bit because they are quite hard and yeah we just drink them like that so I guess even dry leaves can be frozen can't they and they will still retain their good um, properties yeah that's a good plan yeah okay well I guess we will leave the other questions for next time when we have more time, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Clark, for um, your time and the presentation. I think we were all very blessed with um, this topic as well. Um, so the next one um, will be again 8 p.m. for us, which is 5 a.m. for you again. Um, but I guess it will be a bit earlier for us, which will be great. Um, and there were a few topics that were suggested. Yeah. Um, what uh, topic would you like next time? So the suggestions were either um, you mentioned gratitude, which is very good. Um, so either that or brain health or also um, we wanted to talk about the drugs as well. All right. Uh, well, uh, I don't have my gratitude one together just yet, um, but uh, the other two, we have them all ready to go. And uh, so it's up to you. Um, yeah, we've had questions about drugs and um, I, I had a request to send your presentation, which I, I have done, but I think it's a very um, current issue that... You know, many people want to know which drug is um, better than the others or <laughs> um, which one can I take oh, well. safely? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll uh, let's plan on doing that one next time and uh, we'll cover drugs and uh, perhaps alternatives. How's that? Yeah, sounds good. Sounds very good. Um, let's do that for next time. So, yeah, um, thank you very much again. And um, if we can ask Dayan maybe to close with a word of prayer. Sure, no problem. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the message today. Thank you that you love us and care for us and that you want us to be healthy and happy. We pray that uh, you will help us to live our lives in accordance with your will and that we will make good decisions and good choices with our lifestyle and with the food that we eat that we may be a blessing to each other and a joy to you we thank you in jesus name amen, amen. thank you Dan. thank you very um, much just a minute, my wife has a question. Oh, she was wondering if you are accepting donations for your uh, program over there, your ministry. Um, we are. We are a donations-based ministry. We've got our details here as well. We have listed on our YouTube as well. So we started, um, yeah, we started making the details available for people and um yeah we usually well the last few times we've put down our details and um the details for your ministry as well dr clark so yeah all right uh, so let's see where so if we go to your youtube uh, channel then we should find it um you would find it here for now since we don't have a website yet but that is um 
um, that is ongoing. So we are working to have a website soon, which will make it easier. Um, but right now we just um, we just put down the details, the PayPal email address and the direct deposit um, bank account details. So for now, that's how. Um, All right, very good. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I guess we will see you next um, Saturday, 5 a.m. again for you, Dr. Clark. Yes, and 8 p.m. for you. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> We are all looking forward to that. All right. Well, God bless and, and have a good week. Thank you. You too. Have a great weekend and have a good week. We'll see you next time. So everyone else, thank you very much again. Uh, for joining. Uh, don't forget we have another presentation which is not ours but I um, posted in the um, uh, signal group as well as um, yeah I'll post that on Facebook as well. There is a presentation tomorrow evening 8 p.m. for us with pastor and Dr. Sam Davis. So he's a medical missionary as well. Um, I'm also looking forward to watching that so if you can join that'll be great. Um, if not, we will see you all next um, Sabbath evening, um, 8 p.m. So thank you very much. God bless and see you next time.